This is the special session three, human talent development in the era of FTA. Uh, hello, good afternoon. I'm Ji Sun Jung. I'm a director of uh, global cooperation in Korea Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training. Actually, uh, this session uh, was going to uh, be chaired by Director uh, Taeho Bak, but he has an urgent personal engagement. So that's why I'm here to replace him. And it's a great privilege for me to have this session. Uh, actually, this session was organized uh, to consider about the concept like that and to be flexible in the global era of rapid change, Korea has signed for free trade agreement with 45 countries as their economic uh, partners. And such liberalization and globalization policies are not only require institutional changes in economy and society, but also the performance uh, of the developing human talent educational system. It is important that understanding the customer needs and leading the global market trend to hold a dominant position in FTA. This session uh, will focus on discussion of necessary global human resources development and investment strategy on national and corporate level in the era of global FTA. The session will also cover the practical human resources development strategy uh, to incorporate into the global market and take a professional advice for preparation. Now we have very distinguished speakers and discussant and uh, we have, uh, I will introduce two speakers, honorable speakers. Uh, they are first, Philip Martin, a professor of UC Davis. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and Professor Park Sung Hoon, a professor of Korea University. Thank you. Also, we have very distinguished panelists. And uh, by my side, uh, Professor Ann Kruger, uh, Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another, another distinguished panelist is uh, uh, Kim Jae-ho. He's a CEO of uh, He's a CEO of Hed Hedrick and Struggles. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you for coming. Now let's start with the first uh, uh, speaker's presentation. Uh, <coughs> Professor Phil Martin, thank you. Would you give him a big hand? Well, thank you, and I want to thank the organizers as well as all of you for being here on a beautiful day. Um, after hearing a lot today about the global economy and human resources, we're going to basic. We're going to run through uh, several sort of issues, and there's sort of three kinds of measures or three kinds of takeaway messages. One is, of course, that countries are trying to get talent or brain power. People say having a lot of brains within borders is what can maximize growth in knowledge-oriented economies. For those of you who study economic history, remember 200 years ago, we had a theory 
uh, and it was called mercantilism. It meant try to export as much as possible, don't import very much, don't let your people emigrate and get as much gold as you can inside the country. Now we're sort of almost full circle, now we're trying to get brains within the country, even though in a globalized world, of course, many of the things we develop will be traded, et cetera. So the first thing to keep in mind is we are, people do talk about battles for brain power, then we have to say what is it exactly? Is it the test scores of people? who go to college or don't go to college? Is it how many years of education people have? Is it patents? Is it GDP per capita? Exactly what it is, what is it? And as one of the earlier speakers mentioned, is there, economics is about trade-offs. And it's often trade-offs between good things. What's the trade-off between growing your own versus importing? Are there any trade-offs? And if so, what should we do about them? And then, Remember, we're talking about free trade agreements. Most free trade agreements do not allow freedom of movement of workers. Most free trade agreements limit who can move, and they usually limit them to professionals. We'll talk a little bit about the North American free trade agreement because many of Korea's FTAs are modeled on that. And what the North American free trade agreement does is open up the labor market for people with a university degree in about 70 occupations. And the takeaway message is, after almost 20 years, there are fewer than 100,000 people who move under NAFTA. Even though it is a free labor market, it's very easy. Okay, the first thing is, what is talent? Uh, usually we talk about the years of schooling of residents, adults in the population, what certificates people have. We know that you can get in trouble very quickly, as Lawrence Summers figured out, by talking about differences in talent between groups, whether it's men or women or racial or ethnic groups, uh, or even between natives and foreigners. The main message we know is that talent moves to opportunity. And talent moves to where People or individuals move to where they can get higher wages, better benefits. The United States attracts many foreigners to come, in part because we offer stock options, a way for young people, if they're very lucky, most of them are not, but if they are lucky, they can get rich very quickly in some areas. In some countries, there's more meritocracy in business promotions, meaning a young person can rise fairly quickly, as opposed to seniority-based <laughs> systems. In sciences, we often hear about there's less hierarchy in some labs than in others. There may also be more resources. But the main message is talent does move to where it finds the most opportunity. This we'll hear more about. This is the where this is countries ranked by a global talent index that Hydric and Struggles put together. The US ranks very high, as do some of the Scandinavian countries, and uh, South Korea is around 20 or so, but we'll hear more about that. The basic idea is both North America and countries, Canada and the US, rank fairly high on these, as do some of the Scandinavian countries. And um, uh, the Asian countries, especially Japan and Korea, don't rank as high. One thing that comes up in talking about talent is what about native versus immigrant talent? And it usually comes up in the context of science and engineering or what we heard this morning, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And the question is, if your goal is to maximize the number of individuals with so-called STEM training, what should you do? Should you try, remember economics is about incentives. Should we try to subsidize education to get more people who move into those occupations, give out more fellowships? Should we admit foreign students who will study in STEM fields and then let them stay after they graduate? Or should we work to bring back people who've already gotten those degrees and left the country, as China and some other countries do. The United States has a very easy entry program for foreign professionals. We have something called the H-1B program, and we talk, when we talk about a global labor market for professionals, the U.S. H-1B program looms very large. It accounts for about half of the movement of temporary workers who are professionals in OECD countries. And the theory is that it is allowing employers easy access 
to the best and brightest people in a global labor market. It's a very controversial program, and it's controversial because it's probably the only temporary worker program that I know of which it is perfectly legal for most US employers to bring in a foreign H-1B worker and replace a US worker who's already there. In one very famous case, Siemens was the German company, uh, brought in Indian programmers to replace American programmers and as a condition of severance pay, required the Americans to train the Indians who replaced them. Now, the real issue with an easy entry program is you soon run out of visas. And so if you have, this is another example of a trade-off, if you have an easy entry program, yes, people will come in, but many more people will come in than there might be a quota, so the big issue we're having is how do we regulate that. There's a lot of benefits to bringing in immigrant talent. There's almost no economic study which shows that it's bad to bring in people from, who have college degrees. They'll fill vacant jobs. Sometimes demand, as an in IT, increases faster than supply. It takes training before you can get local people to catch up. Uh, and we often hear about people with a different perspective can wind up increasing productivity. We get, we get more innovation when people are looking at things from different perspectives. Some sectors are different. STEM is mostly private sector, and if Bill Gates says you're qualified to be a software engineer, you are. It's different in healthcare, where the government does a lot of the training and issues certificates, and the government affects not just the supply of who a doctor and nurse is by providing the training, but also affects the demand by subsidizing lots of the health care uh, that's delivered. But generally, keep in mind, the immigration of talent is usually a good thing. So as I say, how do we, what's the relationship between domestic and foreign talent in our free trade uh, 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 agreements? Well, remember, some countries bring people who, their nationals who are already abroad, they bring them home. China, Taiwan are well known for having return of talent programs. ROT is return of talent. The basic lesson is that if you're running a return of talent program in Africa, it's hard to get people to go back. But you don't really need to do much with return of talent subsidized programs if there's a lot of economic opportunity because talent flows to opportunity. So when countries start growing, people will come back and take advantage of it. The easiest way for any young person to move to another country is go as a student, earn a degree, find an employer to give you a job. And the general rule is the more education you have, the more likely you can go, you can bring your family with you, and you can settle and make a transition. Let me just say a word or two about the United States and its immigration system, and then we'll come to the free trade agreements. The United States, we often talk about talent flowing into countries via front doors, side doors, and back doors. So front door is people coming in as settler immigrants. The United States takes a little over 3,000 immigrants a day, and the important thing about immigration to a country like the U.S. is two out of every three immigrants are already in the United States when they're admitted. So you're usually in the U.S. in some other status, and then you, we call it adjust. And that's very true for employment-based immigrants. It's not true that Microsoft goes around the world having job fairs trying to hire people. 90% of all immigrants in the U.S. who get employment-based visas are already in the country, and they're usually working for the company that says, we really need you. So in what immigration, and especially employment immigration, means is you have a lot of people sloshing around your society as students, as workers, and some of them elect to settle, and you treat them as immigrants. That Both Japan and Korea are trying to do more of that, but it's not the system of bringing people new from outside. It's people are already there adjusting. So how do people get in? They can come in the side door, which is as temporary workers or students. That's how most flows are. There can also be backdoor. In the United States, most of our backdoor unauthorized illegal migrants come in without any inspection. 
in Korea and most Asian countries, people come legally and don't leave. So I've already said most employment-based immigration, if, so if Korea is trying to increase the amount of talent from abroad, most of the t people would be already in the country and then they would adjust their status. The general rule is the higher the bar to getting a visa, the, the shorter the wait. The lower the skill, the longer the wait. So the United States makes 40,000 visas a year available for exceptionally talented is what the law says. We have never issued more than 5,000 in any one year. Maybe the criteria are too hard, maybe not, but they usually go to foreigners already in the United States. As we move down the skill level, then the waits get longer. And so if it's an ordinary college degree, you can wait several years. If it's if it's less than a college degree, the waits are often uh, six years. The main thing to think about for talent and using years of education is we have some famous inventors, including Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, who did not earn college degrees. And a college degree is usually the first criteria to be considered a professional under most free trade agreements as well as immigration systems. Silicon Valley is well known as an area in which there are many, many immigrants from China and from India who played a role in starting and setting up companies. And it's important to keep in mind that Asian immigrants to the US, so about one fourth of the immigrants to the US are Asians. Asian immigrants are, as it were, positively selected. They come, the Asians who move to the US typically have more education than the Asians who stay back in India or back in China. It's harder to get into the US from Asia. Therefore, it's a highly skilled population that tends to come, Vietnamese refugees being the exception. In South America, in Latin America, which is 55% of the immigrants, it's negatively selected. The average Mexican in the United States has seven years of schooling. The average Mexican has nine years of schooling. So we're taking from the bottom of the education distribution, not the top. Let me just quickly switch now to free trade agreements and talent. We usually start with the general agreement on trade and services. And you all know that services can move in four different ways. And the smallest part of trade and services is what's called the movement of natural persons to provide services. It's me moving to Korea to provide architectural services or some other kind of services. Most trade and services is the other modes, which are like call centers. You do it over the internet or through a phone. You, sometimes people travel to get the service. Uh, much of it is mode three, which is often foreign direct investment to provide things like banking or insurance services. So the issue in mode four, uh, which is moving people over borders to provide services, is that many developing countries would like the World Trade Organization to be, as it were, a world migration organization issuing visas that would allow people to move over borders to provide services. And so there are four issues that the developing countries typically raise in these negotiations. And you can think about what the, where the rules are in Korea as we go through them. Most countries, most receiving countries, our countries, have an economics needs test. And what that means is before I can hire you, I have to first show there's no local workers available. That is obviously a way to block the entry of service providers. Often there are three or more government agencies involved, a labor agency to test the labor market, uh, an interior or a home a security agency that is involved in checking that you're not a terrorist, and then a, a foreign affairs agency that actually issues the visa. They often don't coordinate well with each other. Sometimes you come in with a credential, and you might be recognized as an engineer in your own country. The question is, will you be recognized as an engineer in another country? So a third demand is quicker recognition of credentials, and the final demand is, should people have to pay taxes uh, for social security, for health care, et cetera, if they're only temporarily in the country? Because clearly those taxes will raise uh, cost. 
Now, there's a, a numbers versus rights dilemma that goes through thinking about moving more people under WTO and other things in order to provide services. For example, uh, if you look at it from the point of view of a developing country, the comparative advantage may be precisely the willingness to provide the service at a lower wage. So if you demand equal wages, which is the basis of almost all international regulation of migration, that can wind up allowing fewer people to come. Some sending countries say, let us police the wages. Don't have our citizens have to pay payroll taxes. So what have some of the free trade agreements actually done to facilitate the movement of service providers? Well, we look at APEC, um, the Asian Pacific Economic Council. The, base, the big thing here is a business travel card. And so this is, shows the, pro, the, the promise and the limitations of using free trade type discussions to, to let people move easier. What does it do? You know when you go into airports, you usually see the APEC um, business travel card lane. And what it does is it allows faster entry for short stays in participating countries. But keep in mind, it does not end visa requirements. So an Indonesian who is coming to the US or Canada still needs to get a visa, although there can be an expedited procedure to do that. What hap so, so business travel card is a way to get you faster through the customs, but it doesn't end the paperwork requirements. ASEAN's another example of a, of a, a regional group that wants to have free trade. But even though their plan of action from 1998 says we want a freer flow of skilled labor and professionals, they say, but we can't do unskilled because that would give us far too many problems. Uh, so once again, it's, 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 an, and it's an example of a free trade agreement that says maybe we will do more free mobility, but at least not very quickly. The big exception to the rule is the European Union and EFTA, the European Free Trade uh, Area. And there, they've had the four freedoms uh, almost from the beginning. The idea being that it's, you can move goods, capital, workers, and services over borders. And what that means is, in theory, a Frenchman can move to Germany and seek a job on an equal basis with a local uh, German worker. The, there's a lot, but despite that freedom of movement, relatively few Europeans move. It's about 2.5% of EU nationals live in another EU country. So the question is, why so little? And the answer comes in several forms. One is governments are allowed to restrict jobs to their own citizens if they involve national sovereignty. So a working for the government usually means you have to be a local citizen. But some countries have government-run railroads, so you can have to be a citizen to work on the railroad. Depending on the size of the government sector, 20 or 30 percent of the jobs can be off limits. There's also different languages. Credentials are often not recognized, even though they're supposed to be mutual recognition, the idea that a doctor in Germany is also a doctor in France. And uh, it might be that people are just less likely to move anyway. So here we have an example of free movement, but relatively few people moving. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the European Union is based on this idea that we will first try to equalize economic conditions so that relatively few people move. Uh, and so when you join the European Union, the countries that are already there can restrict the movement of your workers for seven years after entry. And in one of the famous miscalculations, the question in 2004 was how many Central Europeans would move west if they had immediate freedom of movement? The econometricians did their estimate and they said 15,000 might move from Poland to the United Kingdom. It turned out to be a million. Uh, and that was a, off by a few uh, factors. It probably didn't hurt enormously in the UK but it certainly played a role politically because there was a backlash against many, many migrants uh, coming quickly. One issue in Europe that we won't have time to talk about much is this service migration issue. Remember, it's one thing to move as a worker. It's another thing to move to provide services. Keep in mind what that means. The people say, 
is, are, is picking apples off a tree a service or is that work as you can be hired through a labor contractor and provide the service of picking the apples. So you can redefine almost any job as a service providing job. What has happened in Europe is, especially in construction, there has been a lot of intermediaries, subcontractors, who move workers from Poland, an EU member state, to Germany or a, a higher wage state. And one big issue is what wages should those workers be paid? Uh, if the country has a national minimum wage, which some European countries do not have, then they can be paid a lower wage. And so there's a lot of issues, legal issues, that come up when people move to provide services when wage levels are uh, different. You, the EU is trying to encourage more migration. We'll see whether it succeeds. They're trying to bring in more highly skilled migrants through blue cards. Uh, but so far, that has brought very, very few, fewer than 200 uh, in, uh, in many of the countries. Let me just say a few words about NAFTA because this is the top-down liberalization, which is probably most, more relevant for um, uh, Korea in its FTAs. The basic idea is the purpose of a free trade agreement is to free up trade and investment and therefore spur economic growth in all the countries that are participating. And one hope for effect is that if you're having faster growth, then you'll have more job creation and you'll have less, at least unwanted or illegal migration. So NAFTA has one section on migration. And what it did was create a new visa for college graduates in 70 occupations. They need a written job offer. They need their credential, and then they can get an indefinitely renewable visa. And there's no labor market test, there's no wage requirements, and over the first 15 years, this mostly involved Canadians moving to the United States before the Canadian dollar went up, including a lot of immigrants. A lot of Filipinos migrated to Canada, naturalized after three years, and then moved to the US. So after 20 year, almost 20 years of this, we have a little under 100,000 people in, in labor markets that have got 50 or so million uh, professionals. So it's, it's, it's a free labor market, but there's relatively little movement. And that's the important point. If you go top down, it's usually not much of an economic issue, and there aren't that many uh, people. Now, keep in mind what happened with Mexico. We had the free trade agreement with NAFTA, but at the same time, we built a fence. So at the same time we were freeing up trade and investment, we are building a fence along much of the border with Mexico. And this is what the fence looks like. It's not a little fence, it's a big fence. It goes up four or five meters. It's tilted, so you have to climb over the wire to get in. And what we're arguing about, and it's playing a role in the election, is this is the official highway sign as you're leaving California to go into Mexico. And it says, be careful, because there are people trying to come across this freeway, and every year some people are killed. Now, if you're in favor of having more migration, remember, primarily low-skilled, you say, that's a good thing, because that's, those are the risk takers. Those are the people we want. If you're against, you say, no, no, they could be terrorists. And so what happens is, you take the same idea and you get two entirely different perspectives. And it's what happens in an immigration country like the United States, where on the one hand you say, well, we don't really have any option other than to t keep, keep taking in people and legalizing. But on the other hand, we are building this fence. So what does all this mean? Korea, as we heard, has 45 free trade agreements. Many of them are modeled, at least on the migration part, on NAFTA. They don't have very many migration provisions. They're mostly involved with pe business people who are coming as a result of the increased investment. Uh, the question is, will that expand or won't it? As far as I know, the employment permit system in Korea is not really linked to free trade agreements with Bangladesh or any of the other places. And so what does all this mean? Well, we are in a global battle for brains. We really do want, many governments want to maximize how many brains they get within their borders. Nobody knows exactly how we go from brains to talent, whether the years of education is the best measure or degrees or certificates. But the one thing to keep in mind is talent will flow to opportunity. So instead of special programs, if there's opportunity, people really will come. And all you have to do is look at the 
return flow to China and India, uh, which doesn't have a lot of big programs, and the return of talent programs into Africa, where everybody needs to be subsidized to move back. If the easiest way to attract talent is through the foreign student channel, let people who learn the language, earn the degree, stay. And it's probably optimistic to think that anything will happen on the GATS mode four uh, uh, thing anytime soon, because the differences between the countries are too big. Remember, what we want in an ideal world is few barriers to migration, few barriers to trade, but in migration, the barriers go down when there's not a fear of too much migration. As long as there's a fear, the barriers uh, stay very uh, high. So free trade agreements generally limit any kind of associated migration. When they do anything, they limit it primarily to professionals uh, because the numbers will be small and any adverse effects will be small. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Philip Martin, uh, for the very interesting and insightful presentation. Okay, next. Our uh, speaker is Professor Song Hoon Park, the Korea University. Thank you. Would you give him a big hand, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers of this uh, very important uh, forum. Uh, it is my great pleasure and uh, honor at the same time to be here and to share my views on this issue. Uh, the title of my presentation assigned to me is Developing and Attracting Talent in an Age of Globalization with special reference to Korean FTAs. Uh, actually, to talk about uh, talents and uh, human resource development in regards to the uh, Korean FTAs is not easy one. Uh, so that uh, I like to observe this issue from a slightly different perspective. And I'd like to focus on the uh, global challenges uh, pertaining to globalization and the global policy networks uh, we need to implement uh, to tackle these problems. So first of all, I'd like to uh, discuss some issues of uh, uh, issues at stake. I mean, uh, Especially uh, since the mid-1990s, uh, the globalization has become a fixed variable uh, in the world economy. If you take a look at uh, WTO activities, if you take a look at the uh, international investment flows and also financial transactions, you will see uh, every year uh, over 30% increase in international, development flow, uh, international investment flows. Uh, I mean, we have got uh, a global financial crisis and uh, still ongoing Eurozone crisis uh, since 2008. But I believe this trend of globalization will not be uh, strongly negatively affected because it, is, it has become a fixed variable. So, uh, and, uh, in addition to this uh, globalization, which is ever strengthening and ever intensifying, we have another phenomenon, which is uh, the increasing regionalist uh, tendency in the world economy. If you take a look at the uh, WTO website, then you will see uh, the very rapidly increasing number of FTAs notified to the WTO, and especially since the beginning of 1990s. Right? So we can say that the world economy uh, today is uh, facing the phenomenon of, uh, which is very new one, phenomenon of uh, coexistence of regionalism and multilateralism. And uh, regionalism today is uh, much flavored and much uh, uh, focused uh, in the form of uh, the FTAs, increasing FTAs. Uh, in these trends of uh, increasing regionalism tendency in the world economy, uh, the, uh, not only the developed uh, countries, but also developing countries are participating. They would like to uh, make uh, most of all of it, right? So that uh, this is a real challenge for both developed and developing countries. Um, but uh, as you uh, may know, uh, why the uh, FTAs are increasing? 
I mean, the, the FTAs have become a very uh, useful and excellent instrument uh, for market expansion, for their uh, national products, and for uh, economic growth, and for job creation through that, right? So we have to uh, address this problem, uh, this uh, phenomenon, uh, from uh, very various angles. And I think uh, the human resource development uh, is a uh, very important policy area to maximize the uh, positive benefits from the uh, regionalism, which is very increasing and very intensifying. And uh, in these uh, uh, benefits, uh, I think uh, developed uh, and developing countries have to uh, benefit because if only one parties are benefiting, then the globalization trend will be halted and the developing countries would uh, drag their foot uh, from uh, the globalization so that with uh, the increasing FTAs and with increasing uh, really important uh, human resource development, uh, I think uh, the, there is uh, some uh, policy uh, requirement for the international community to address the problem of uh, uh, the issue of uh, human resource development. <clears throat> so uh, before I go over to uh, discussing uh, the global and regional dimension of uh, human resource development, I'd like to briefly sketch what types of human resources are needed in this era. So we have globalization. At the same time, we have uh, increasing uh, regionalism tendency so that uh, uh, the, these two phenomena uh, needs uh, and require uh, uh, some type of uh, talent, some type of qualification. And uh, in this uh, type of, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, human resources, uh, I think the human resources uh, which can play a global role should be equipped with uh, uh, knowledge in international economics international relations, international economic law, international business, and so on and so forth. And this uh, uh, is what, uh, how I say, uh, the, uh, here really the interdisciplinary uh, uh, education is uh, very needed in this field. But these international economics uh, uh, and the like are very broadly defined uh, disciplinary areas uh, so that apart from those areas, I'd like to propose that uh, because uh, here we have a uh, number of uh, young generation people, so that I'd like to give some advices. Uh, in five to ten years, you will be uh, able to play a global role and you will be lead the uh, Korean and global society as global players. So, uh, in addition to this uh, br uh, broadly defined and broad-based uh, disciplinary areas, you have to acquire uh, special knowledge in labor standards, for instance, environment, intellectual property rights, and so on and so forth, right? So that uh, the uh, requirement for uh, challenge, uh, meeting the challenges uh, put by this increasing globalization, increasing regionalism tendency uh, is what you have to uh, do in the future. I mean, focus on uh, special areas and become a specialist in these areas. Uh, first, uh, before I go over to regional dimension of uh, the human resources needs, I'd like to uh, discuss the global dimension of human resources. I mean, uh, the human resource development is a very crucial factor uh, for economic development. And this is why some international organizations and some international fora uh, have started to tackle and to uh, support the developing countries uh, in this field. Uh, one example is APEC, which was established in 1989 as a uh, cooperation body for Asia and Pacific Basin countries, has uh, adopted Ecotech uh, as a uh, cooperation pillar. And within this Ecotech, human resource development is uh, assuming a very important part, a very important share uh, is, or is allocated to this uh, human resource development. 
over the past years, I, was, uh, I have been involved in a number of uh, international development work uh, funded by the Korean uh, government, uh, like COICA. And uh, we have got also, uh, for about eight years now, from 2004, a new project uh, to help the uh, developing countries, uh, which is funded by the most uh, Ministry of uh, Strategy and Finance of Korea, uh, which is called uh, KSP, uh, Knowledge Sharing Program. And I have met a uh, number of uh, government officials, academics, journalists, and NGO people from developing and least developed countries. And they do uh, focus, they do also accent the importance of the human resource development, especially what they require from Korean uh, experts is uh, to help them out in establishing and developing the vocational training. So the, uh, one of the organizers of this forum, CRIVET, uh, is uh, uh, very important in this regard as well. So CRIVET, uh, I hope, uh, is uh, in the future playing a major role in uh, Korea's ODA activities uh, for the coming years. And uh, especially uh, as uh, international organizations, ADB, Asian Development Bank, and World Bank, are also uh, doing a lot of uh, capacity building activities for developing countries, and especially in human resource development. So uh, in this regard, I mean, uh, there is, uh, uh, I cannot uh, enough uh, uh, emphasize the importance of uh, human resource development, not only in the national context, but also in the international context. And also we have, uh, uh, especially uh, 2000, uh, since 2001, uh, we have uh, a major negotiation round under the auspices of WTO ongoing, which is called the DDA, Doha Development Agenda. But the DDA is uh, struggling to be completed. We have got uh, many problems, uh, and uh, somebody, uh, some people say that uh, DDA is uh, uh, is going to be uh, a failure, some says, uh, or some try to save this process. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, with this uh, uh, process of DDA negotiation struggling, uh, the uh, less developed countries and least developed countries are in need of some support for them to uh, not to give up the efforts to integrate themselves into the world economy. So here, we also need uh, some uh, <coughs> uh, international efforts, especially in the form of aid for trade, right? Because, uh, I mean, uh, in this aid for trade, I can say that uh, uh, in these years, uh, Korean economy uh, is achieving uh, relatively well. And uh, if you take a look back at the history of uh, Korean economic development, the international trade was at the core of uh, Korean economic uh, instruments for the economic development, right? So aid for trade means uh, the uh, developing and least developed countries should be helped uh, to manage uh, the trade to contribute to their respective economic development. Um, as well as, uh, as you know, in the uh, Millennium Development Goals, which will be uh, finalized in 2015, uh, there is uh, al already a successor of this uh, initiative, which is called Sustainable Development, Growth, uh, development Goals. And all these uh, uh, the, uh, new changes and the new phenomenon environment are uh, such that uh, the uh, developing countries are in need of some support from the international community. So uh, capacity building activities for human resources uh, of the developing world uh, all should be strengthened in my view, uh, especially in uh, areas of uh, trade facilitation, they need uh, some expertise, um, such as customs procedures, and they need uh, some uh, expertise in the trade and investment promotion, uh, the SPS uh, areas, IPR, 
and RO, rules of origin, all these specific areas, they need the support to uh, have the capacity building uh, process. What, uh, what is the regional dimension of uh, human resources needs? I mean, uh, human resources needs are also uh, considered uh, because we have increasing intra-regional connectivity and intra-regional context. So we have to consider that. Um, one of the phenomena we can observe uh, in the past decade is uh, increasingly intensified regional production network. Somebody calls it uh, value chain. Uh, somebody calls it uh, pro uh, regional production network. So. Uh, with this intensified produ regional production network, uh, the countries are trying to uh, strengthen uh, their uh, international ties, and especially in one region, or uh, trans-regional ties are also uh, uh, being strengthened. So here, uh, if you take a look at the Asian context, we could uh, draw some lessons uh, from European experiences. Um, with this increasing connectivity and with increasing, as uh, Professor Philip Martin already noted, uh, the increasing migration uh, is needed. And for doing this migration and for, help, uh, for helping the migration uh, proceed and proceed, we need to address some uh, issues. And, especially educational uh, programs, intra-regional educational programs or international cooperation programs in education sector are needed. And one example the European Union was very successful in uh, is Erasmus program. Erasmus program was originally designed for European Union member states only, but it is now extended to the world as a whole, right? So. Korean universities, for example, can participate in Erasmus Mundus program, which is uh, solely funded by the European Commission, etc. And uh, we, uh, the Asians, did not have uh, such programs uh, until recently, but it is very uh, encouraging that uh, from this year, uh, the uh, Campus Asia program was established and launched uh, among the three countries in Northeast Asia, CJK, right? China, Japan, Korea, uh, the uh, education ministries got together and they have uh, devised this uh, cooperative program for education sector, which is called Campus Asia. Campus here, I uh, wrote this uh, intentionally in capital and uh, this is not a uh, normal campus, as you see in Korea University or in Seoul National University, etc. But it is, uh, it stands for Collective Actions on Mobility Program for University Students. So when uh, universities are participating in this program, uh, by the way, Korea University Graduate School of International Studies, uh, I am in, uh, has got uh, one project uh, here, and we are cooperating with the Kobe University Japan and Fudan University uh, China. But this is for uh, increasing the number of uh, student mobility, as well as uh, students can have uh, not only exchange program, but also they can participate in dual degree programs as well. So you can stay one year in Korea, and you can stay one year in Japan, then you can get two degrees from your respective universities, right? And this is uh, the spirit of uh, Erasmus program as well. So that uh, it is very encouraging that uh, the uh, three countries in, in Northeast Asia have started uh, this kind of cooperative program. I mean, uh, these kind of uh, cooperative programs can be expanded and expanded uh, to encompass other areas as well, then this intra-regional cooperation uh, mechanism could be strengthened. So uh, this is a regional dimension of human resources needs. I mean, 
uh, we need uh, to meet the challenges of globalization, to meet the challenges of increasing regionalism and intensify the production network in the region, as well as value chains. Uh, we have to uh, build up uh, human resources who are able to address and understand problems and issues not only in their respective nation, but also in other countries, uh, neighboring uh, their countries, right? So Erasmus, Erasmus Mundus program, as well as uh, the Campus Asia uh, is, uh, in uh, East Asia is a really very good start uh, in this uh, direction. Summarizing my discussion, I'd like to uh, discuss very briefly what kind of uh, new policies are uh, needed. Number one is, uh, as I noted earlier, uh, the human resource development is a very important issue at, the, at uh, our times. And especially the developing countries are in need of uh, uh, development of human resources to tackle their problems and obstacles on their way to economic development, right? So that uh, I propose uh, that uh, uh, when doing ODA activities, we could more focus on uh, HRD. And uh, uh, another time I'd like to uh, mention the importance of CRIVET in doing that. Uh, in uh, helping the developing countries in establishing uh, vocational trading programs. So uh, post-2015, because 2015 is the year of uh, ending of the uh, MDGs, we have got the Sustainable Development Goals, and I uh, would like to propose to the international community that the uh, HRD should be a integral part of this uh, post-2015 programs for international development. And in the regional uh, dimension, uh, especially uh, we can uh, say that uh, accumulating and disseminating and implementing uh, and learning each other uh, of the best practices uh, will be very helpful. And uh, as I noted, uh, the encouraging sign of uh, uh, the, uh, or sign sent by the uh, Campus Asia, I think uh, it should be uh, expanded and expanded. It's uh, a, uh, still a CJK cooperation program, right, trilateral. It's uh, confined only on uh, Northeast Asia, but the designer, or architects of Campus Asia program have already noted that this is intended to be expanded to uh, Southeast Asia. But I would like to say, why uh, not to whole Asia? And why not uh, having programs like Erasmus Mundus opening the doors to other countries in other regions, right? So uh, Asian countries uh, could be more courageous to open their doors, uh, especially uh, in the context of uh, this forum, uh, the educational sector and human resource development is really very important. So uh, it's so much uh, that I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you for wonderful presentation. Uh, now we have two panelists for the discussion. Uh, after the discussion, uh, we you you may audience may have a floor to ask and make a comment for the presentation. And now uh, we have uh, Professor Ann Kruger. Uh, she's going to make a, a discussion about the, on the two presentations. And I think we. You will have about 10 minutes each, each panelist. Yeah, thank you. Would you give her a big hands? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, although I may be flying under slightly false colors. 
because I regard myself more as an economist on international trade than I do on human resources issues. And when I agreed to come, I saw the you know uh, FTA part of the title. But then as I thought about it, uh, what got to me a bit was that, well, you know, really, uh, we think about trade, we think about trade and investment and all these things, we think about a resource base and how productive resources are, and that determines comparative advantage, and that determines trade, and of course, their FDI and all the rest of it. And when countries trade, they do it on the basis of their comparative advantage, and how does it matter whether it's an FTA or not? It's always in a country's interest to have a more trained, more educated, more productive labor force. And in that sense, I sort of, I think, came at this from a slightly uh, different angle than, uh, in part, the paper givers did. Uh, I think F Phil Martin's paper was very interesting, and I learned actually quite a bit from it, and thank him. But it seemed, again, coming from the trade angle, I take it for granted that we are not going to see the kind of international mobility that I think he, as an idealist, would like to see, and which might make sense in another world, but in this world, we won't have it for the time being. Uh, so I tended to take a slightly uh, different approach to it, uh, and I just want to make a few remarks along the way. The first thing I think I'd really uh, like to just point out is we do need an open multilateral trading system. And FTAs are all fine and good if they lead to the greater openness of the trading system as a whole. There is a danger, and I think a real danger, uh, that they can go the other way, and they can become protectionist, at least in some significant part. And I've seen this in my own country, the United States, even in the NAFTA agreement and in others. Protectionism comes about in several ways, but let me give you a couple of examples uh, from NAFTA, which is the one, of course, I know best because it's one that's closest to home. One of the things that happened in the NAFTA agreement, and it was quite on purpose, in the sense that the lobbyists knew what they were doing, is, of course, that the American auto companies were worried about competition from Japan. The Japanese were producing or assembling some of their autos in Mexico, and they were using a lot of parts imported from Japan to assemble the cars in Mexico. So what happened in the NAFTA agreement? In order to be considered a, a product with an origin in North America and therefore subject to the no-tariff rules, you had to have 60% of the value-added content of the car produced in North America which basically took away part of the advantage of the Mexican assemb or the assembly in Mexico of cars because they didn't meet the 60% rule. And of course, the auto companies opened up in the United States to offset that. Now, that was actually protectionist because Mexico was a cheaper place, but this just sort of wiped it out because the Japanese parts couldn't come in there and then become part of the eligibility in the United States. And there are many examples of this. Uh, when NAFTA was formed, uh, not too long after that, the Mexicans had a foreign exchange difficulty because of problems that I won't mention here, but which basically meant they had to do something. And what they did is they slapped a 7% surcharge on all imports except those from NAFTA countries. So it was discriminatory against the rest of the world. And a free trade agreement is not a free trade agreement. It's a discriminatory or a preferential trade agreement. And it does differentiate between trading partners. And that has all kinds of problems. Uh, Korea has a lot of free trade agreements. I th last I looked, and this is a couple of years ago, I think Chile was the champion free trade agreement arranger in the whole world. They had more than anybody else at that time. It changes from time to time. But the Chileans have a uniform 5% tariff on all products, or they did at that time. But in all the free trade agreements, you don't agree that we will lower all our tariffs tomorrow. You say, okay, two years from now, we'll take them down by so much. Three years from now, we'll take them down. And of course, some producers say, oh, we're going to have such a terrible time adjusting, so they get longer. So some goods get uh, the tariff reduced uh, by in half in three years, and some in five, and so on and so forth. What happened in Chile was that pretty soon, domestic importers discovered that it was taking very long at customs for goods to come in, because the customs agent had to say, okay, now this is a good that's being imported from India, and so let me see which category it's under to see whether the 5% tariff is reduced to 3% or 
The result of which was that the delays in customs cost more than paying the tariff. But the result pretty quickly was that they decided they'd better get through the whole thing very quickly. But you can get yourself all tangled up in bureaucratic paperwork just as a result of this complexity of the different staging of the di tariffs from the different countries at different times. So I want to just caution on being too enthusiastic about going the FTA route if, in fact, that means that you're not as much as you should be supporting multilateral opening, which is in everybody's interest. I understand that the United States is not exactly innocent in this regard, so I'm not in a good position to say that everybody else should do it right just because the United States doesn't, but I'll say it anyway. Okay. Um, I, Phil Martin's talk, as I said, was very interesting. Uh, the same kinds of problems arise within a country in areas where there's out-migration. In the United States, we've had a lot of out-migration from the upper Midwest, where uh, the farms were getting bigger, and so you were getting people moving to the cities and so on. And the natural question arose, should these people in these parts of the United States pay for the education of their children? Because obviously those children, or many of them, were going to migrate to California or to uh, Arizona or where, Texas or wherever. And the obvious answer was yes. The answer is that you want to educate your own offspring, your own younger generation, for the very simple reason that that will enable them to be more productive wherever they are, and that's in the interest of the country as a whole. Whether then, in addition, migration enters the equation uh, is, is, I think, almost a separate issue. What wants to do the best one can by one, for one's own people in terms of providing them with the opportunities and all the benefits that education can have. So in that sense, I think that we need to talk a little bit more about needing education for, if you like, the sake of the domestic economy, for the sake of domestic productivity, which is, after all, what drives real wages. And yes, it's nice to have it. And yes, the demands might change a little bit because you have a free trade agreement and the trading pattern might change. But I think that's a very secondary reason. But that much said, there's another issue. And it's important in Japan. And I think it's going to be important in Korea. And that is that we are facing, in both those countries, a very rapid shift in the demographic composition of the population, where the labor force is quite quickly going to peak and decline. That's going to put pressure on all kinds of things, all kinds of social services, because as the fraction of the elderly goes up, the need for health care rises, the need for social insurance pensions rise. And the fraction of the population that is older gets goes up very quickly. And so what happens is that instead of having one elderly person who needs the social welfare and, and social insurance and who needs the health care uh, for 10 workers, then pretty soon it's one person per five, and then pretty soon it's one for three and one for two. And obviously, the tax consequences or the expenditure consequences go up very rapidly when that happens. Uh, there are several things one can and should do. Uh, you can raise the retirement age, and I think most industrial countries are getting to the point where that's part of it. Uh, you can lower the welfare benefits, the social insurance component of things, et cetera, et cetera, and these are being done. Even so, my read, and I'm no expert, but I've seen the numbers on Japan and Korea, is that some increase in permitted in, in migration would enable a smoother adjustment because otherwise it's going to come very fast. And so I would think more in terms of the potential for immigration easing the adjustment burden to this very rapid change in the ratio of the working population to the, those who are dependent on the public sector for a fair amount of their uh, income and uh, well-being. So I would sort of turn the issue around a bit in that regard, and I just want to point that out, that I think this is something uh, Korea needs to look at. But in general, you want to increase productivity of the labor force for its own sake, because that's, after all, what drives real wages. And you want to offset the demographic pressures as well. And all you can really do is, as I said, retirement age, things like that, maybe get participation rates in the labor force up, and there's some opportunity for that in Korea. The other thing that can be done, of course, is make sure that there's more flexibility in the labor market domestically. Now, that flexibility is good whether it's an FTA, whether it's open multilateral trade, or whether whatever. So that all of the things that can be done uh, for improved productivity and employment of the labor force, improved education, are good anyway. And then, uh, once that happens, you can look a little bit, perhaps, at the change in needs because of the trading arrangements, but I would regard that as a secondary factor in that regard. Um, 
That much said, I certainly agree that we need, in the world as a whole, and especially in developing countries, uh, to get to Professor Park's remark, uh, more capability of all kinds that enable increased globalization. Many of the developing countries do not have the personnel for any of these things, including negotiating even within an open multilateral, a round of multilateral trade negotiations. They do not have the talent. There have been problems there. There are whole kinds of specialized fields in intellectual property rights, uh, in phytosanitary arrangements, all of these things, uh, and we all need increased competence in all of them. The fields, the, uh, I, I looked the other day at just a little list of the various fields, even within intellectual property law, as it pertains to the international training system, and even on just a gross cut, there are probably 25 different specializations among international lawyers in that one subject alone. It's, all of these things are areas uh, where, especially the developing countries, but all of us, are going to need uh, more specialists than we now have. Um, my last comment is one that I, I toss out, kind of like the same one on the uh, demographic pressures, and that is that globalization itself has been benefited many, if not most, if not all of us. And globalization is going to continue. And one of the things that it seems to me is going to need to happen as our life expectancy is longer and all that, is we're going to have more time for education uh, at the early stages of life when it has the highest payoff. One of the things I hope will happen, at least in my own country, the United States, is that we will find ways perhaps to lengthen the time it takes to get, let's say, a university degree and have everybody as an undergraduate expected to spend one year of their education in a country overseas, and I don't mean Americans going to England and vice versa, I mean getting into uh, some kind of different culture. My guess is that that will come more generally, that the desirability of more exposure uh, to the rest of the world, more understanding of what's going on, is going to be an essential part of productivity everywhere, and that it will happen. It will happen because of globalization. It will happen regardless of how much we move toward the open multilateral system or how many free trade agreements there are uh, I think that's underway, and we're going to go in that direction as well. So I can't add all that much to the uh, some sides of it here, but it does seem to me that we shouldn't really say, okay, because of FTAs, the human capital dimension has to be quite different. Everything points to the need for upgrading human capital everywhere, just as a part of economic growth in the world as a whole, and the trading part comes out as a result of that not that we need to do change things in human capital in order for trade. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our second discussion is Mr. Mr. Che Ho Kim. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Because I am a panelist, I, am, I, I give some comment sitting here instead of the moving to the main desk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very honored to be here to discuss about th this topic with famous professor, Professor Kruger and Professor Martin and Mr. Park. And uh, let me start with uh, Jim Collins' world because I am the global headhunter who is dealing with the global talents in the real business world. Jim Collins is the author of the best seller, the good to great, and the great by choice, said, people are not your most important asset. The right people are. Just, who are these right people? Simply put, they are these employees who are the most capable of making vital contribution to the company's performance. Then, in the age of the globalization and FTAs, who are these the right people? Personally, I can say that the global citizens who have the dual, more than dual citizenship is the one group of the right people. As countries start aggressively going after talents globally, dual citizenship is increasingly popular, even though the Korean government does not allow dual citizenship completely. Even there are so-called triple citizenship people who have citizenship to be born, to be educated, to be working currently. Today, 200 million people in the planet live in the country they did not grow up in. 
When we define the global talent management, there exists a different, a number of different base, baseline approaches. Global talent management includes the integration of the various talent management processes, all of which enable organizations to be acquired, developed, deploy, and motivate the global talent across the world. The degree, the degree of the integration depends on the where the, those companies stand in its evolution, evolution as a global company. There are similar but a little different three groups in the global continuum, multinational, international, global companies. International, comp international talent pool apply for the organization with predominantly domestic operations and Limit, uh, limited to overseas activities. It typically draw from the centralized talent pool generally located in the region and the country where it has headquarters. Its international business are managed independently and utilizing separate resources. And multinational talent pool are private organization who is doing business in the multiple locations. Each, each country's business managed as the separate entities by the local employees, but the, the, the corporate headquarters dispatching the, their expert to the countries to manage the leadership role and the business sensitive critical factors by the local entities. Global talent pool of private organization with operation around the world, which utilize series of the differentiated talent pools. A cadre of the talent is shared and leveraged globally, regardless of the national and the geographic boundaries to service both global and local markets. In the, in the, in the, in the industry, in the real business world, there are no specific or the particular actions and preparations for the FTAs in the talent developing and the hiring point of view. But they are preparing for the globalization for a long time. I talked with the CHR of the Samsung Electronics and the Hyundai Motors Group before I came here to discuss about the FTA issues. But the, they said uh, they didn't prepare the FTA, but they has prepared for the globalization for a long time. For example, Samsung Group has started global talent management from two, 20 years ago. There are two symbolic programs. One is the regional specialist, and the other is global scholarship. Every year, Samsung dispatches almost 40, 400 employees to other countries in the world where they want to go. Each step stayed in the certain country for one or one and a half years to learn its culture and business, etc. Up to now, Samsung sent around 4,700 steps through this regional specialist program, and most of them are working there successfully. Hyundai Motors starts the global scholarship program last year, like Samsung did 10 years ago. Hyundai Motors select some certain strategic countries like Russia, China, India, and bring the best local college student into Korea to provide MBA programs in the major Korean top universities. After graduating MBA, they work in the Hyundai Motors headquarters for two to three years to learn Korean culture and the Hyundai Motors business style. And they will go to the Hyundai, Hyundai Motors subsidiary in the world and come back to their, or they come back to their countries to work in the local Hyundai Motors companies. They will be the future leaders in the strategic countries or region 10 to 20 years later. So this kind of the program, through the, this kind of program, the, the global companies prepare for the globalizations. In the year of the globalization, I found several interesting features 
Firstly, there is a shift on the way from brain drain to brain circulation around the world. Skilled immigrants and professionals from Asia are returning home. And talent management shift is from retention to attraction as the number of the rapidly developing economies are growing. In the globalization area, diversity is becoming a new trend. Multinational and global companies are doing their best effort to acquire best talents across the world, regardless of the race and color and nationality and gender. According to the, our company's survey, with 490 companies among Fortune 500, 307 companies established chief diversity officers position. And McKinsey reported that 58% of the global companies with CDO role enhanced its productivity. And Mr. Martin, I have a very simple question. Uh, you said the FTA prohibit limit the mobility, but in the real world, global talent can move around the world easily. So how can he apply for this, the, your, the rule to the, in the real world? Sorry, um, what I said was the FTAs typically do not include freedom of movement for workers at all skill levels. Mm -hmm. They normally facilitate movement for business and investment. Mm -hmm. But remember, like with the APEC business card, you cannot work for wages in the country you're visiting, mm -hmm. right? That's prohibited. Um, what the NAFTA does is in addition to making it easier for people to go and visit their investments and, and, and uh, et cetera, it, we have facilitated a lot of intra-company transfers. So you're employed by a company abroad, usually one year, and then you're allowed to move to a subsidiary in another company. That's very easy. But we've gone in NAFTA one step beyond that and said, if you are a Mexican with a U.S. job offer and you have this degree, you can live on limited in the U.S. and work for U.S. wages, and there's no kind of labor market test. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that with freer trade and investment, yes, there's a lot of movement of people to take care of their investments. The issue is, at what point can you work for wages in the local labor market? Because remember, those people are typically self-employed, so they're not working for wages. That's where, the, that's where the legal mechanism comes in, when you're starting to work for wages in the host country labor market. I hope that helps. OK, thank you very much for our presentation and discussions. And now the audience has floor to make a comment or to have a question, if you have. OK, if you have a question or want to make a comment, raise your hand. Yeah, I think you go ahead. Do you have a microphone there? Yes, please. Would you introduce yourself first and make a comment? 안녕하세요. 저는 용인 외고에서 온 이유송이라고 합니다. My question is actually um, for, especially for Madame and Mr. Martin. Well, I would like to direct your attention to the aspects other than the structural system of FD, FDA, which is the perception regarding the migration in Korea. Well, in the case of the United States, many people are racially tolerable to an extent that America is called the melting pot. However, in Korea, a lot of people consider themselves as homogeneous society, that current drastic increase in the number of migrants with different racial backgrounds um, are actually fostering some social conflicts. So in what way do you believe Korea should address this internal issue to pursue more harmonious development in long term? OK, thank you. And uh, before uh, Professor Martin answers, we'd like to have any more questions? Oh, oh yeah. Who raised the hand? Oh, yes, please. Uh, my name is Charles. Uh, I'm an MBA candidate. I studied in uh, Fudan University in Shanghai. And 
I happen to see that there are many Korean students uh, studying in China because we all know that China is the land of opportunity and definitely like Korean students are the furthermost the first uh, like foreign students who are going to China and get the opportunity but in fact Korean students are coming back they are coming back to take uh, TOEIC which is a language proficiency test for English they're not getting the job in China which I'm going to ask uh, uh, the professionals about this question that uh, the China Japan Korea relationship is very different uh, compared to NAFTA I guess which is the most successful well, not successful but most practical model that is for the human resource FTA relationship and I would like to ask that what can be our like next move to Korea Japan and China because definitely right now we are having recently we are having territorial like conflict these days and it's really like a big a barrier to that movement and as a as a job candidate, I wish to know what like most of employee would be employees have to prepare or see as a future. Thank you. And you want to get a comment from answer from whom? Anybody? <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, as we don't have much time, we'd like to have just one more question if you have. Yes, at the back, please. Sure. But I hope we could be short, okay? Not long question, please. At that uh, left hand side from here. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marina Gershovich from Kazakhstan. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Graduate School of International Studies, Seoul National University. Um, I would like to address um, a question to Dean Park. You mentioned the importance of um, ODA in particular in the sector of uh, human resource development. I wonder how much room do you think there are um, for Korean companies overseas to participate in those efforts in the developing of human resources in the developing countries? Thank you. Thank you, and we, because we already six o'clock, so I will uh, ask the, uh, Professor Martin make a brief comment and answer. And also, uh, Professor Bach also make a very briefly, okay? And that is, that is, that is going to be our, the end of our session. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, very briefly. It's <laughs> hard to become an immigration country. It was never easy in the United States, but as Professor Kruger said, many countries like Korea and Japan that have defined themselves as non-immigrant countries likely will take more immigrants if for nothing else, to negotiate this aging society. Germany is a famous case in Europe, which for years said it's a non-immigrant country. It now has seven million foreigners, quite a few more who have an immigrant heritage. It's not easy. Um, there used to be prejudice against Italians, all the different groups. So it's a, it's a process. It's going to take several generations, but I have no doubt that that it will happen, it won't be easy, but, it, but there will be more immigrants. When we look at NAFTA and then we compare it to China, Japan, and Korea, remember that even though countries can be next to each other, can border each other, there can still be relatively little interaction. There were relatively few Mexicans studying in the United States or Americans studying in Mexico. I mean, NAFTA has really unleashed not just more trade and investment, but a lot more people flows than ever happened before. So we can look at how few there are, that there are many more Chinese and Indian and Korean students than Mexican students. We can also look at how fast the number of Mexican students in the US has gone up, because it's gone up percentage-wise very fast. So just as you were saying, Koreans studying in Shanghai but coming back, Keep in mind, you know, it's probably far more today than it was 10 years ago, and it'll probably look even different, more different 10 years from now. So we always have to remember 
you know, it, these things do take time. They don't happen instantaneously, but I have no doubt that there will be more and more acceptance over time. Thank you. Dear Chairperson, please allow me to use about five minutes because uh, there was a very important question uh, from uh, Fudan University uh, PhD candidate. Uh, so I'd like to address uh, that a little bit more in detail mm -hmm. before I mean, uh, the question from SNU student, uh, what kind of activities are being done by Korean companies in meeting these challenges? I think uh, we have uh, several examples. Uh, one uh, example is, I know the Samsung Electronics has uh, done a very long uh, cooperation uh, program for uh, educating and for training uh, the uh, government officials or also talented uh, uh, human resources from developing countries under the name of Global Expert Program. They have invited uh, 20 students every year and they have run this program uh, for uh, 10 years on, uh, at Korea University, but uh, this program is now being run by Songgyungwan University since Samsung Electronics is involved in uh, uh, Songgyungwan University as a foundation. Uh, second example is uh, POSCO also is uh, sponsoring uh, five students um, uh, in uh, 10 different universities, as far as I know, uh, every year to invite uh, uh, talented students from developing countries. And especially this uh, POSCO program is for Asian countries. And uh, in this post program, as far as I know, the Central Asian region is also included. So Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Indian uh, students or Chinese students are all enjoying this. And also there are uh, several other companies uh, we can quote. I mean, the Korean companies have become increasingly uh, responsible uh, in, the, in the regards of, in the sense of they are increasingly considering the CSR as a duty. And also uh, in the international community, but also in Korean society, the PPP, uh, public-private partnership in doing international development work is very important, uh, has become increasingly important, and uh, we are paying attention to it. Uh, coming to Fudan University students' question, uh, CJK relationship, what should be done? I mean, uh, it is really a very difficult uh, issue. And uh, you and I would need uh, more than half an hour to clarify some things, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, I, was, uh, invo I have been involved in some projects uh, which is commissioned by uh, KDI, Korea Development Institute. Uh, we are now in the third year, and our project is how to bring about the East Asia, North East Asian or East Asian community from Korean perspective, we are doing that. But uh, you know, there are a number of uh, think tanks in Korea, and not only in Korea, but also in Japan and China, they are doing this work. And uh, I have noted that uh, the Campus Asia is a very good step forward, right, to, to improve the trilateral relationship. But also I think, uh, a, uh, another very important step was taken last year by the heads of states of uh, three countries, China, Japan, Korea. The, uh, I don't know whether you are aware of the TCS, Tri Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. Uh, this is a cooperation secretariat uh, for fostering the uh, trilateral co uh, relationship and uh, they have uh, agreed upon to make uh, this uh, secretariat as a permanent organization. And they have set up this uh, secretariat in Seoul. And uh, uh, this uh, September, they have celebrated the first anniversary. Right? And I think uh, this is uh, really a meaningful step forward into right direction because uh, this uh, CJK, Three countries have uh, to increase their contacts, increase uh, their cooperation projects, and Campus Asia is one of them. 
and they have a number of other projects. And uh, uh, I hope uh, that uh, this will uh, uh, result in, uh, this will contribute to easing the very difficult relations between the three countries. And uh, well, I think uh, I can continue my talk with him uh, later. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, for allowing me some more time. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. So uh, I think we can uh, conclude this session that HRD is the most important factor, key factor in FTA era, and also the international communication and cooperation can help uh, develop each other. So thank you very much for honorable and distinguished speakers and panelists. And also thank you also very, very much for the audience. Thank you. Have a good evening.